Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending today's session of the forum. As many of you may know, my name is Mary Wallace, and I am the Life Enrichment Coordinator here for Friends Homes Guilford. It is my privilege today to introduce the newest installment of the forum. These standing for thoughtful historical experiences and forum meaning a place, meeting, or medium where ideas and views on a particular issue can be exchanged. Here we welcome you to explore each other's lives, professions, and experiences. As we dive into the niches of our neighbors, we encourage open-mindedness, attentiveness, and the willingness to learn from others. I have recently been able to get to know the Youngs during our overnight trip to the Outer Banks. Please forgive me for what I'm about to do, okay? <laughs> Whether it was singing, Dale, in front of the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse, or talking politics at a gas station in literally the middle of nowhere. I enjoyed their company, experiences, and stories. Within the two and a half years they have been here at Friends Homes, they've become active members of this community. Fran, who has been taking lessons and playing ukulele for about two years now, can also be found learning watercolor in Tom Brown's watercolor class. Margaret, an avid knitter who often makes garments to be donated to Whittier, our skilled nursing facility. Oh, yes. Fun fact, these two are also dancers in the Greensboro Scottish Country Dance Group. So if you need to learn any steps, they got you covered. After meeting with Margaret and Fran multiple times, I knew these two shared a unique connection. And if you ever want to hear a cute story of a young couple meeting at a bar, falling in love, and being together now for how many years? 60 years. I would ask these two how they met. Yes, that's, that's amazing. That was the internet. He said the bar was the internet version of today. But today, they will be telling us about their recent journey to Israel. Using this picture presentation, we will see and hear about current events and the lifestyle of Israel. So please help me in welcoming Francis and Margaret Young to the forum. First, I'm hard of hearing, so I want to know, can you hear me? No. Can't hear me. I know what that's like. Now can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So let's begin with a moment of silence. Thank you. First of all, I want to give you a little background and a little disclaimer. Um, yes, we do dance with some Jewish friends at the Grange over here, Scottish Country Dancing. And in December, they invited us to go to Israel. We heard about their trip. And so we went to a couple of information meetings, and we decided we would go. We talked to the rabbi, and he said, this is not a Christian tour. This is about Israel today. Its problems, its culture, and its accomplishments, and its challenges. So with that in mind, we decided that we would go. On... Uh, the disclaimer is the politics and the religion and cultures of Israel are so complicated, I do not, or we do not, claim to be experts. So we may make mistakes and we just ask you, forgive us. <clears throat> so we had a couple of get to know you meetings with uh, Temple Emmanuel and the, the people where we were going with. It was a group of about 28. So on February 19th, we set off from Greensboro to Newark Airport and flew 
to Tel Aviv, which is 10 and a half hours. That's a long time. We were lucky because we had a young girl with us who had traveled a lot, and she knew when to get snacks for us and to make conversation and when to get up for the bathroom because we're at the age where bathrooms has to be approached very often. <laughs> So she really started our trip off, and we were really grateful for her and what she uh, imparted to us. Our group was supposed to meet on Monday at around 4.30. One of the things we have to tell them is that we were only on the plane by ourselves. There was none of the 28 people with us. So that was why this girl was such a help. <laughs> You know, because I think we thought one other couple was going to be there, and they weren't. <laughs> and they decided they didn't. They, it was a short uh, trip in Newark, uh, you know, like a short time. But it, but the plane was actually delayed, and it was a long t longer time that we waited. And so we were okay, but everybody was afraid to take that flight. So we were the only ones that took the flight and said, we're doing wheelchair, we'll be okay. <laughs> It only had an hour in between boarding time, but because it was a delight, it was very nice and comfortable. So, Israel did not exist when I went to grammar school. It came about in 1946, and you can see how things have progressed and why there are problems there. We all met around the 4.30 time, Monday afternoon, at Tel Aviv. This was our bus that was going to be with us for the time we were there. We met our bus driver, Alan, and our guide, Harry, who was there, who, by the way, spoke five languages. So we were with a very good person. <clears throat> On our way to the hotel in, to Jerusalem, we stopped for a meal in an Arab restaurant. And you can see the food was magnificent. Is that fish? That is fish. This Lady Rabbi spoke to us after the meal about getting more reformed rabbis who are women into Israel. So right now they have about 200. So the temple is reformed. And, huh? Yeah, it's reformed. So she was telling us what the challenges are because reform women rabbis are not welcome in some parts of Israel. 
so she has a tough job. We checked into our hotel, and it's uh, right inside the heart of Jerusalem. It's called the, the Dan Panorama, and we went to that chain each time we visited some place in Israel, and it was very comfortable. It was a kosher uh, hotel, so there was no meat. It was all vegetables. So then we checked in, and the, the guide said, be ready to get on the bus at 7.30 the next morning. So we went down for breakfast about 6 o'clock, 6.30, and there was the spread, which we could not believe. As big as our dining room was, was their dining room, and in every wall there was a buffet. And down the middle, they had vegetarian dishes, salads, fish, all kinds of breads, omelets to order, cheeses, fresh fruit, and pastries, and fresh juice. Unbelievable. But no meat. So it was an unusual breakfast for us. No ham and eggs. After breakfast, we set out or the Western Wall, which is the remaining part of the Second Temple that's left. And we had organized it so that we would meet up with the women who were demonstrating at the wall. What they are demonstrating about is they want equal representation at the wall. They want Well, the, the men get to go down to the wall and they can have nice festivities there, but the women have to be very silent in the, in the, and they're separated from the men. And so they're saying, hey, we want to just be part of the whole thing. Yeah. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. yeah, they want to just be part of it. So once a month they're doing this demonstration. And there was lots of women rabbis there, and um, but... The thing that, I, so I was part of this demonstration, and Fran was in a, another section. And I was we in the men's were, section. He was in the <laughs> men's section, which was behind us. And then they, he was in the men supporting us. And then behind that were the Orthodox. Behind us was the Orthodox. And what surprised me when I was going to a women's demonstration was all the men at 8 o'clock in the morning going to the wall and a lot of orthodox was what I was seeing. And because they have the little you know, hats on and the little world. So I, um, I was surprised, but when I got to the wall, I said, what is that noise? And it was them booing and whistling. So the, the women were wanting, had that little prayer book and we, they were, you know, they were actually worshiping but they were booing and doing all that while they were worshiping, okay? And, and then um, this part here is where someone in our supportive group brought a Torah. And there's a great song, I mean, I could even sing it, Torah, 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 if it's fun. And so they were all singing, so I kind of enjoyed myself there. I quite enjoyed the demonstration. And um, so they all turned and they sang the Torah song and um, when they held out the Torah. And, but then afterwards we were, but we had barriers between, all over barriers to keep us safe. And then when we were ready to, when the demonstration was over, we had to be escorted out by two soldiers behind us. I, I, they seemed to be behind me um, I was some uh, trailing at the end, and they had, what is it? AK-47. AK-47 rifles. And then, you know, but some of the things, when the women were walking out and some of the barriers, 
there was there were men putting their hands through and 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 also when we were at the wall there were two three or four young girls who were saying they were down very close to us saying really nasty things but we were told not to interact with anyone but one of the girls just couldn't help herself and she just said how do you learn such hatred to say such hateful things and i asked what did they say and they would not repeat what they said because it wasn't worth repeating which i thought was very nice that they wouldn't repeat it okay so now i'm on the men's side i'm with ben Cohn, who has been there many times and he took me into where other Orthodox people, this is, you can't see them, they're inside, they're worshiping. And then he said, we want to go down closer because the young men were dancing and singing. And so we moved down closer. And all of a sudden, the young man grabs my hand, he grabs Ben's hand, and we're in this dance. <laughs> and Ben says, don't worry about what the singing is, either la 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 or ya ya ya. And he was right. But see, I had a joyful time there, and Margaret's experience was entirely different. Uh, after that demonstration, we went to the city of David. This was found about 10 years ago when they were trying to build a road, and it's about 30 feet down. It was, and they discovered it was David's palace, and they have been excavating it ever, or archaeological excavating it ever since. Now, along with the palace, there's a well which runs from a spring all the way into this place here. This well was built during the time of Hezekiah when the Assyrians were attacking Israel. So the guide said, I want to warn you, this is a very strenuous trek and it's two miles down. So Margaret decided not to go and I did the trek. And you can see it's all of this has been hollowed out of solid rock and it goes for two miles. Sometimes it's very wide, other times it's like this. But we finally got to the source of the well and then we had the trek up, which was very strenuous. When we got up, our guide told us this source of water is where Jesus healed the blind man with mud. So this was an embarrassing thing because we were not in an interfaith group. But somehow or other he discovered Fran and I were the only Christians there. And he kept on saying, and since this is an interfaith group, and he would tell about Jesus. And so I would go, oh no, I don't know. I didn't know what to do, and I. But I said to myself, "Well, I'm not in charge, you know. It's not, you know. I, I can't help if he says that." But and I never did get the rabbi by himself. And finally, I said I did, and I said to him, "I'm very sorry that the that the guy the guy keeps on saying it's an interfaith group." And he said, "It's okay. I talked to him about it, but he still does it." <laughs> so he says, "I gave up." <laughs> After that uh, tour down to the well, we uh, went to the government plaza. The government plaza contains the Knesset, the Supreme Court, the Bank of Israel, and the Academy of Hebrew Language, and the campus of the Hebrew University. It's a huge complex, but we can only go in certain parts because the guards were there sensing trouble. Why? Because Ramadan was only two weeks away. And so, I forgot to tell you, at the wall they built a tunnel over the wall so the Arabs who were going to come in hundreds of thousands to get to the mosque and there were guards all over with AK-47s. 
But we felt safe. This is the Knesset entrance up here. Okay, the next day we visited Yad Vashem. It's the Holocaust Remembrance Center. And uh, we were not allowed to take any pictures. But it was very interesting because Margaret and I had been through this about 10 years ago. But it's entirely different when you go through it with people whose relatives were in that that part of the years and maybe lost their lives. So when they went through Yad Vashem, they were looking at it entirely different than what we looked at it. So that was a new experience. It was interesting because there's also a Holocaust remembrance in Washington, D.C. But Washington starts with the liberation of the camps. This one starts with showing you the Jewish people were normal Germans, Poles, whatever they were. And it shows you how gradually they lost their freedoms. Till eventually they were trapped and they, they could do nothing. So what was frightening was we saw some of the same things that we're seeing today anti-Semitism, categorizing people, you know, all choosing who's superior and who isn't. So we were kind of frightened when we saw that. And what books you can read and what you can't. Yeah, same thing, books that are considered non-important or shouldn't, you shouldn't be reading. So we were kind of frightened by that thing because it showed you step by step how they lost their freedoms. <clears throat> what, what they told us was, and I had never heard this, that Hitler, when he took over, he sent men to the southern part of the United States to learn the Jim Crow laws. Okay, they lived there for about two years. Then they came back and they said, Here's how we can do it. So basically, they just substituted Jewish for Negro. And you can see how it gradually applied. <clears throat> also, Hitler organized how to do the final solution. But he called doctors, military generals, professors, very intelligent people. And they sat and worked out the final solution. Then he had them sign their name to the document so they could never claim they were not part of it. That was frightening, that they were so casual in how they went about this thing. <clears throat> and uh, uh, Rabbi Andy, after the trip, uh, tour, said, Let's have a service of worship. So we were outside and we prayed the Kaddish, which is a prayer for the dead. But I asked the, my friend next to me, uh, what does it say? Because it's all in Hebrew. He said, it praises God for what he has done. There's no animosity or hatred against God. And when we went outside, they pointed out to us, the Garden of Remembrance. And this is for Gentiles who helped save Jewish people during the, uh, and Oscar Schindler's name is there somewhere. But there's all kinds of memorabilia put out 
to honor those people. They, well, they have a they have a garden of remembrance, and it's for the righteous people. They call everyone who helped them the righteous people. So, what do you see now? You see a valley full of trees, right? Every one of those trees is to represent someone who died in the camps. And there's thousands of them that have been planted. It's very impressive. Next, we visited Mount Zion, which is a microcosm of uh, Jerusalem sacred and multicultural. That's part of the garden. That was the garden of remembrance. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> In this Mount Zion complex, we saw King David's tomb and the room that is alleged to be the room of the last supper. Those items are very sacred to Jews, Christians, and Muslims, and they were constantly fought over during the centuries. Next, we drove south to the Judean desert, Masada. Some of you have already heard about Masada. Masada was on top of this mountain where King Herod built his retreat center when he wanted to get out of Jerusalem. But when the Romans decided to destroy Jerusalem, the Jewish people fled to this as a way of surviving. They had lived, uh, the Romans came in and they put it under siege for two years, but they couldn't get up to it. So what they decided to do was make a hill, fill it up with dirt so they could just walk up. We ascended by cable car. <laughs> and some of us and some of us did some people and did some walk. brave souls walked the trail. Yeah. Which, this is the view from the top of Masada. That's the Dead Sea in the background. Now you see the trail. It goes all the way up to the top. So once you're there at the top, you can see a synagogue. You can see a cistern, which I collected water. And you can see food storage areas and other important things. They were able to collect water, which could last them two years from just the rains. So eventually the Romans reached the top and the Jewish people who were about 967 up there decided we are not going to be slaves to Rome. So the night before the Romans broke through, they all committed suicide. The father killed the family, then he killed himself. So there were 960 bodies that uh, were lying there when the Romans broke through. And the Romans had prepared a victory feast. And when they saw this, all these people, they just were stunned. They didn't hold a, a victory feast. But this area has become a memorial to Jewish freedom. They will not result to slavery. After that, we went to the Dead Sea. <laughs> That's part of the group. What we were surprised was we had been to the Dead Sea 10 years ago. It has shrunk tremendously. And all along the Dead Sea, there's fences to keep you out because they have sinkholes, which are very dangerous for children and Adults. And these sinkholes are about 20 feet deep. So uh, it had changed tremendously since we had been there, not just 10 years. Yep. So, 
This was this was our friends from dancing and me, David and Melody and I, having a mud bath. <laughs> and then when you when you take a shower, your your skin feels just wonderful. It's a lovely it's a lovely feeling. Yeah, but we had fun doing that. <laughs> I did not go in the Dead Sea. I had been in the Dead Sea before, but I'm a floater. And there was a pool. We were inside a hotel where we were just using the hotel. We were able to have lunch there and use the facility. We got lovely warm towels and showers and all kinds of really nice facility that we could use while we were there. And um, I went in the indoor pool and I mean, trying to get my legs back down was something. I'm just a floater. I float. I can float anywhere in any pool. And um, but put me in the dead in the in the in the salty water. I mean, I just have a hard time getting my legs back down. And they, you know, so so the rabbi's wife Mickey gave me the the nickname of floater because yeah. <laughs> she couldn't believe it. You know. Uh. There are saltwater poles and they have rails on them and you have to hang on to them or else you flip up. I swam outside in this pool and it was very, very cold. <laughs> we also had lunch here, which was very good. Again, it was vegetarian. We. Um, The next day, our itinerary changed because there was uh, two people shot in the West Bank, and they decided that it wouldn't wasn't safe enough for to do that. We were going to go to Gaza. We were going to Gaza, Bethlehem, places like that, and so they took us in another direction, where we saw a museum that uh, talked about how men and women developed convoys to bring in food and medicine when Jerusalem was under attack in the 46, 47. And most of those people who were in the convoys got killed. But they had this museum to memorialize them. Our guide did decide to take us into parts of Palestine, but when you go through a checkpoint, have to be looked over. So we're in the bus, two young people, one a man, one a woman, Palestinian, with their AK-47s, come on the bus, talk to the driver, and they, 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 before that they told us, do not make eye contact and do not talk to them. So that we were very good. But they walked up and down the bus, looked us over and decided we were tourists, so we were okay. A little scary moment. <clears throat> we stopped at an Arab restaurant in Palestine. This is on our own, on our own time. We had, we had free time. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we would be with someone who said, oh, I've got to have chicken. We've got to have some meat. And so... They called this a what? Shawarma. Shawarma. But, it was but instead bread. of a little pita bread, it's a big pita bread. <laughs> so it, it was very good. And the weather had cleared, so we were very happy. This is a view of the Arab section. And you can tell by the minarets. And also, the guy told us, most Jewish homes, most Jewish homes are like this. Because they come from Europe. Or the Arab home is flat roofed. So that's just one way you can tell. <clears throat> So, so what our, our Jewish friends told us was we did get to the West Bank, but not really. We were just looking at it from, from, the, from the bus. I mean, yeah. 
We just got on the outskirts. Just on the outskirts, yeah. Because yeah. we kept on saying we didn't get to the West Bank. They said, yes, you did. <laughs> so while we were there, we talked, we were visited a place called the Roots Dialogue Center. It's in the West Bank, and it's to bring Palestinians and Samaritans together and to have dialogue and discussion about reconciliation. You said Samaritans. Huh? Samaritans. Yeah, I did. They're Jewish. Okay, okay so um, the Palestinian speaker, I don't know if he's on here or not. And before we get into that, we stopped, I mean, we didn't stop, we took a picture of Bedouins. Bedouins, we saw Bedouins from the bus. Now what, what the guy told us was, Bedouins are doctors, nurses, professors, but they live in these corrugated houses that look like homeless shelters. And he said, people ask them, if you're so wealthy, why do you live out there? And they said, for 2,000 years, that's been our culture, and we don't want to leave it. So it was hard for us to imagine. Now, these are people with doctorates and things of that nature who are still living like this with their families. I gotta go back to this one. This is, we went to an Arab Jewish culture center. And uh, let's see. Um, a paladin, I have to go through this one. This was it. Palestinian father on the far right, he told us how it was to live in Palestine and also to relate to the Jewish people and raise his children. He said, I have the most difficult time teaching my sons respect for Jewish people because the social media bombards them with hate. And he says, as they get older, they don't listen to me, they listen to social media. So that was something that we, we were surprised to find out. The gentleman on the left is Jewish, and he and this gentleman work together. It's like a retreat center. You can come and discuss things that you don't usually discuss outside on the street and s seek answers. This gentleman was telling us about. This gentleman was telling us about uh, when he, before 1946, his mother lived in that time frame, and she wrote down like a diary, and uh, in it she explained how many times they had to flee from danger, and the the. Um, he collected her writings and took them to a publisher and made a book out of it. It's called A Song from Of Many Voices. So he said when he read the book, well, the letters, it changed his life and he wanted to learn more about his family, where they came from and how they survived. Okay, and the next day we went to a Shabbat service. Well, that night, I'm sorry, that night we drove back to Jerusalem and we had a Shabbat service and a meal at the home of a Reformed Jewish person. And the next day we walked to a synagogue and had an actual Shabbat service.
That was first? Okay. Well, when we come to that. So, in this service, we learned that they were singing a song that we know. It's called Sanctuary, if you've ever heard of it. And so, we got to sing it in Yiddish, and then uh, the rabbi didn't know it, so we taught it to him. <laughs> <laughs> we traveled north and visited a kibbutz where the concept of a kibbutz was developed for the, uh, for the people who were there in the 46 area, 1946. It was a new concept. How do we live in this strange land, raise food, and still survive? And so the kibbutz concept was developed in this place. This was Caesarea, which uh, the Romans built in honor of Caesar. That's like a Colosseum thing. We went there because we couldn't, but this was part of not going to the West Bank in yeah. 2000. Yeah. And we, it's now Caesarea National Park, and uh, you can see it's right on the Mediterranean. We stopped at a place that Jewish and Arab people use art where they can be together, but not in any confrontational way. These are, uh, this is a playground which they have painted murals on and around the wall. So there are small organizations that want to find ways to get together and talk about some of the issues without the threatening of politics. And also in this facility, they were making these, you'll never guess what that is. You've heard of chalk drawings? Chalk drawings? This is a spice drawing. And it's all different spices glued to this mat in that design. And that design is 8 by 10. Does this smell good? Yeah, and that's an amazing. That's another one. The amazing and beautiful. They're working on it. It's almost like sand, you know, like sand, but except it's herbs. Yeah. So Spices. it's, a, it's a place where young people can gather and work and not feel threatened. You have the clicker? Yeah. Oh, she's got it. The next place we visited was a, a Tunisian synagogue. And it's the only one like it in the world. So that's what it looks like from the outside. You, on the inside, you can see all these drawings. They are actually mosaics. And there was a man who worked in the post office and part-time he did all of this stuff. This was on the walls, on the ceilings, and on the floor. He, he just painted scenes of, from the Old Testament, uh, from the Torah, from nature. Just, just an amazing piece of artwork. It was very decorative, and unusually decorative for a synagogue. You know, but See, this man, that was his passion to do this, yeah. And they had seven Torahs, and uh, the rabbi was able to unwrap one and show us what it looked like. And that's all embroidered on the outside. See some of more of the artwork? Um, okay. We drove to a, a museum that showed how the synagogues came into being 
after uh, the Romans drove everybody out. Oh, they, that's good. They had to figure out how do we come together and worship because we don't have the temple anymore. So this was one design that they showed us. This is a modern design that they now have. So there were probably 30 of these designs. And there's another one. We traveled to Haifa, and in after we left Jerusalem, yeah. we went to Haifa. So in Haifa, there was a lady who had lived in Jerusalem, and she said, "You know, I've lived in Jerusalem 20 years, and I don't know who my neighbor is." So she said, "I'm not going to have that here in Haifa." So what she did is she talked to the mayor. He donated land for her and they built these community gardens. And so Christians, Jews, and Muslims can come here and work together and not feel threatened. What's good about it is the, for the Arab woman who was kind of landlocked in her home, she's not allowed to go out and what we would call just wander around unless her husband's with her or a male member of the family. So now she can come and say, I'm going to go work in the garden and maybe work next to a Jewish person or a Christian person. And it's a neat concept because they all live in the same area. And this is like a neighborhood. Yeah. And, and so this is called like a mixed neighborhood. And so the lady felt like then she had friends, she had neighbors. They've also built right in the middle of this garden a lovely... Um, center where they can all meet and have lunches together and 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 really you know it's really nice and she didn't want to bring our children up in a place where you know they didn't know anybody yeah <laughs> we visited a place uh, which was called an, an asylum refuge people who are seeking asylum can go here and get their lives back together. These two were from Africa, on the, they were from, from, what? from Ethiopia. Ethiopia, and they had escaped Syria, escaped their death. So they were there putting their lives back together. And also while they were there, they made things like this, which they sold to support themselves. Yeah, and then they had all of these. They had all kinds and of things. All that kinds of beautiful things. Beautiful things. So yeah. they were able like to... Like table runners and all, with all beautiful materials. It was lovely. Yeah. Now the sad thing is, if because they're not Jewish, they cannot live in Israel. They have to, they have to figure out where they're going to go. They, everybody always greeted us with cake and tea. And so that they had baked this cake. And they said, uh, who has a birthday? Nobody had a birthday. So they said, who's the oldest? That's me. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't really the oldest, but that day the oldest wasn't with us. So Frank got the job of cutting the cake. <laughs> That's one thing you notice about people in small groups, their hospitality. Next, we visited a winery, and this is run by 200 special needs people. They live there, they work there, and they make this product. And they have school there. And they have schools. They have medical clinics, and they have horses for therapy. So it was really nice. It was beautiful. We were outside, and this is the inside. This is the inside of the, where people can come in and have a glass of wine and, and have a tasting kind of thing. You know, like, instead of like a coffee shop, it's a winery. The, and the, um, they have a, this is a wall that's decorated, and it said, we label wine, not people. <laughs> I thought that was really nice, yeah. So it's kind of like Peace Haven Farms, if you know where that is. Peace Haven 
south near beyond Burlington. They have uh, special needs people that keep the farm running. But this is unusual because it's self-sufficient. It was started as a kibbutz and it later grew into a, a, a big operation. Well, it was a kibbutz and then that they took over the kibbutz and turned it into a winery with special needs. Now, actually, this we're actually doing this a little backwards because we actually went to this place first before we went not to the winery, but before we went to the place where we cut the cake. We're actually in Tel Aviv now. We moved out of Haifa. The garden was in Haifa. We're now in Tel Aviv. Let me just stop. But I want I wanted to say though, we're we're in Tel Aviv, and I want to know I want you just to know that we were doing a tasting of different food there. And then we landed at the at the asylum place and they had a big cake for us and tea and popcorn. Now we'll remember <laughs> that. And we were pretty stuffed from eating all day. Uh, before this picture, we also went to Akko, which you call Acre. That's where the Crusaders landed when they invaded Israel and the Arabs. The problem was they all came from down from Spain and Europe and Italy, but they didn't know what a Jewish person looked like. So they killed anybody that they met. So it was a disaster in terms of uh, their goal was to capture Jerusalem and make it, uh, according to their way, what they found in, along the way was a sugar industry. The Arabs had learned how to make sugar. The Crusaders took that back to Europe, and that's why we have sugar. <laughs> also, the Crusaders developed a banking system. As they captured different towns and took all the loot, they would store in those towns. So when they needed money, they would go to one of these towns, give you them an IOU, and get the money. Because the town was now occupied by the Crusaders, so they were safe. So if they needed more money, they just had to conquer North another town. But that's how our banking system got started. Okay, we're now in Tel Aviv. We've seen a lot of things about Tel Aviv on the news. This is the gay community. Our guide is a gay person who is going to take us on a tour of this neighborhood, which is gay. And, and it's a market. It's a, it's a market. Mm -hmm. We went along to different restaurants, and he would stop, and he would bring out some food, and we would do a tasting. And they would tell us what we are going to eat. <laughs> but they would just, it was just, it was wonderful. You know, so this was, we had several tastings. This was just one. <laughs> so originally this was a rundown section. The people who live there have modernized it. Uh, they have schools, they have medical clinics, and uh, And they have, and they have a beautiful park. Beautiful public parks. Uh, and when they had the Gay Pride march, they had a quarter of a million people show up for the Gay Pride. So this was an unusual, unusual part of our tour. Yeah. But we felt very good, and they were very hospitable. The guy gave us a list of gay words, gay words, and said, go ask the people in the square what they mean. And he said, everyone will know what they mean. Now remember, they're written in Hebrew. We don't know what they mean. So we found a man, and he told us every word. <laughs> this is another neighborhood. This, yeah, you can talk about that. So this is another neighborhood that we visited, and um, this is called the monster. 
And they, in this neighborhood, they were deciding that the children were afraid of monsters. They were talking about monsters a lot. So they decided to build a playground with a monster. And the children could go inside. You can see there's a hole inside. And they said it's kind of like a womb, which I thought was interesting. They could be, they could be safe inside the womb. And so there was a place for them to stay, and then they would climb up and come back down the slides. And then they said it really became a wonderful thing because the children loved it so much that the parents would say, if you don't get your homework done, we're not going to the monster tonight <laughs> or today, whatever. But anyway, it was, so this lady, um, she was telling us about this neighborhood and all that they're doing again to uh, bring people together. So all the, all the neighborhoods were, they sort of worked in neighborhoods and really worked outside of Jerusalem to bring people together. Tel Aviv is an unusual city because it contains so many different types of people. Uh, the Orthodox live there and the beach is divided. This is the Orthodox, this is a Jewish reformer, this is families, and this is for women. And for gays, they had a separate division. So um, everybody feels at home there, and they're living their lives. I don't know if you've ever heard of the Druze people, D-R-U-Z-E. Okay. We this, had never heard of the Druze. We had never heard of it. This is a Druze lady. It's D-R-U-Z-E. Her job was to teach us how to cook a meal. So we were in what we call a culinary workshop. One group of, we were divided into two groups. One group had to make mushroom stuffed pita bread and cooked on this grill. My group had to make stuffed grape leaves and stuff them into zucchini. This lady taught us how. This is the end product. You may want to go. Yeah, so um, she um, put, we were surprised. They were small zucchini, and we had to cut off the end, both ends, but the, the one end you cut off, but you didn't make a hole. You just cut off that little thing at the end of the, you know, without making a hole. And then you cut off the other end, and then you had to scoop out all the stuff inside and make a hollow. And that's where the grape, the stuffed grape leaf went. And then um, she put in, she had a bowl, and the, the rabbi tried to tell us the recipe, but we didn't get it all. We were busy trying to stuff the, the grape leaves. And, um, but there was egg in it and uh, rice and all kinds of, as you can see, other things, um, onions and things, and she was doing that while we were doing stuffing the zucchini. Then she had it put it in, she had it in a big bowl, and we all got some of the rice from this mixture to stuff the, the grape leaves. And she didn't want us to put too much in, which you know you can do. And so we did that and then she said, now I want you to put and that was the plug into the zucchini. It was called the plug, which was our work of art, putting, <laughs> doing the great leaves. And then she put a plate over that, and it's in a, it was in like a big, you know those, I'm trying to think, but it's a really heavy um, yeah. iron, kind of, uh, with the white inside, I can't remember what you call it, but it was a heavy dish, a big bowl. And she um, then put a plate on top and pressed it down and then she poured boiling water over the plate until it was like, you know, so the rice, you know, the rice would, and then she cooked it till the water disappeared, basically. It was still juicy, but, you know. Um, but anyway, then she, then she came in and said, one, two, three, and turned it over, and this was the, the result. And it was absolutely delicious, yeah. So that was fun. Okay, so the question is, who are the Druze? They uh, are a people that go back to Jethro, Moses' father-in-law. 
I don't, I don't know how they got to Israel, but that's <laughs> another story. But they have a mixture of beliefs, Christian, Jewish, and Muslim. And they're all mixed up. The one thing they do believe is you must be buried where you were born. Because they believe in in, re in They believe in incarnation. Reincarnation. Re yeah. Also, uh, you have a choice. When you grow up, you can be religious or you can be non-religious. If you decide to be religious and you're a man, you must undergo study for three months. If you're a woman, you have to undergo study for six months. No, it's the opposite. It's the opposite. <laughs> the, men need, the men need a little longer. Yeah. That's because they have to do military. <laughs> but uh, I looked it up in the Google. Guess where the largest Druze population is? In this yes. country, in this country. California. And I have never heard, I had never heard it. I, I spelled it D-R-E-W-S, and it was D-R-U-Z-E <laughs> when I was making my notes. So you can see that during this tour, you would never visit these places, because you're always looking for the biblical things. But this shows you what Israel is really like today. It's got a lot of different, this is the upper room, uh, that I talked about previously. On our way home, which was our last day in Jerusalem, or not last day in Tel Aviv, the bus driver treated us to a meal. If wine, it was really the tour that, 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 that yeah. Not the bus driver, that's yours. Yeah. The wine came out, the vegetarian dishes, and then the meat up here, the piled flames underneath, and we just had a ball. <laughs> and that was on our way to the airport to yeah. get our flights home. And then we flew home. Any questions? Wow. Oh, you were going to be up in it to be. Oh, too. yes. Yeah. This, I took a picture of this because it really surprised me. This, I took a picture of this. It really surprised me. That's George Washington. This is what he told in 1790. He, talk, he talked about the government. And he said, this government of the United States gives, no, gives to bigotry no sanction. May the children of the stock of Abraham who dwell in this land continue to merit and enjoy the goodwill of the other inhabitants. Never taught that in history. But I, would, I just took a picture of it. I was so, so surprised. Where was it? It was in a museum. It was in one of the museums one of the that talks about it. Yeah, one of the museums that we visited in here was George Washington. You know, what? You they, know. they were showing the history of the Jewish people from the Crusades up to right now. So you can tell your children, your grandchildren. Okay, any questions? I know we've been a little long. Can you go back to that first map of the four rings of Israel? Go back. You have a question? <laughs> okay. I remember when I was in Israel, I had a, a geographic map, and the, the map, there was a couple who knew nothing about what they were doing on that bus. But it, it, so you it, can see why there's a few problems in yes, Israel. But I had an Arab, we had an Arab guide, and he kept talking about the best West Bank. And finally, one of them, the man and the couple said, what's the West Bank? And so I, that's what I wanted to see that map again. West Bank is up here. Mm -hmm. Where Gaza? No, that's not the West Bank. It's the West Bank of the Jordan River. 
Who is it over here? West Bank of the Jordan River is on the right side of the map. Oh, okay. On this side. Sorry. And that green area up there, on the third map, that's pretty much considered the West Bank yeah. area of Israel. All west of the Jordan. So. Ashkenazi is Russian, Europe, that area. Sephardic is Spain, and that area. We didn't hear anything about that. There, I'll tell you just some impressions. Uh, the government they had before Netanyahu was moderate. Netanyahu is hardline. He's, he's a military man, basically. So, how do you solve your problems if you're a military person? <laughs> he, he's not used to discussing and negotiating and things like that. So, the young people, especially in Tel Aviv, they were just march, starting to march when we left. But they don't care about all this stuff. What they want is to be able to raise their families amongst different groups of people and live in peace. They want democracy. And they want democracy because Israel has no constitution. The Supreme Court is final on political decisions. So you can see where they have problems. In Tel Aviv, they want the ability to change the government if they want, or speak about it. Uh, but the new government was trying to say, it's this way or the highway. So they're going to work it out. So what we were trying to show is that people are really just like people. They want to just live in peace together. I did want to tell you, we visited a place called uh, Shimon Perez Center. And this is where he tried to work having peace through innovation, of bringing Arabs, Palestinians, Jewish people together and work on some of the problems. One of the things they developed was the heart stint by working together. The stint. They're working on projects now for climate control because water is very scarce in this area. They're working on uh, medical. I heard just a week ago that they were working on a cure for cervical cancer. So they're all working together trying to attack these problems rather than fighting. Them.